Okay, so this is going to begin uh, chapter 23 in our evolution unit. And the TOK question here to think about is, uh, is this. Natural selection is a theory. How much evidence is required to support a theory? And what sort of counter evidence is required to refute it? So go ahead and write down your answer to that. I'll look it over in class. We'll talk about it. And uh, then we'll move on. Okay? All right, so chapter 23 deals with the evolution of populations. And evolution, I like this quote from Sean Carroll. We watch some of his videos sometimes. It says, evolution is indeed a matter of chance, but in the random lottery of mutations, some members of and combinations better meet the imperatives of ecological necessity, and they arise and are selected for repeatedly. And we talked about this in class. We talked about how the idea of mutations just basically happen at random, and whether or not the mutation is good or bad just determine, is determined basically how this organism is interacting within a, with its environment. So for instance, when we looked at those rock pocket mice, uh, what we were saying is the mutation that arose when the black lava was there that resulted in a black rock pocket mouse enabled those uh, mice to survive in that black lava. Whereas normally if that black lava wasn't there and they were in the um, sandy tan colored desert, that black mutation would be very quickly weeded out of the population because that mouse would stand out on the background. And we also talked about vice versa. Occasionally there is a tan colored mouse due to a mutation in the black population. And that uh, tan colored mouse is very quickly re weeded out of the population uh, uh, of those organisms that reside on that black lava. Okay, so, um, you know, just to kind of reiterate some of the stuff we talked about, I put that quote in there. Okay. All right. So the essential idea here is that the diversity of life has evolved and continues to evolve by natural selection. We talked about natural selection, of course, being the interaction of the organisms with the environment. Okay. So one of the common misconceptions here with evolution that we need to kind of iron out is that uh, the notion of individuals evolving, and it's just simply not true. Individual organisms themselves don't evolve. They're given the genes that they've got during the uh, that they received during the process of mating, and whether or not that combination of genes um, is good or bad basically is determined on how that organism is going to interact with the environment and how many offspring it's able to produce. Okay, so populations then are the smallest unit really that can evolve. So you have a, a population with a lot of variety in there, and some of the individuals are more suited for survival and reproduction, and others aren't. And those that survive and reproduce and produce more offspring, we say are more fit, and those that don't, we say are less fit. And those um, individuals who are better fit, of course, are ones that are more likely to pass on these genes to future generations and so forth. And just because you're fit right now in this particular environment doesn't mean that that might not change in the future. And, and that population would kind of oscillate back and forth between, um, you know, those, uh, um, I guess, traits that are considered good right now for, for competition, for survival, for fitness. And those that are considered bad may at some point in the, in the future kind of reverse themselves. Okay. So... Microevolution basically is evolution on the small scale. And this is the change of the genetic makeup. These are mutations, things, uh, you know, recombination, et cetera, et cetera, things that occur from generation to generation. And Darwin's problem basically was that there were a lot of limitations of science at the time. So some of the things that we kind of take for granted back in the 1800s when Darwin was studying this stuff, um, he didn't have access to those types of things. He didn't have a good explanation, for instance, how these heritable variations um, that we now know about, you know, the, the differences in the genotypes, how these things were required for natural selection and how they appeared in a population. And he didn't really have any explanation for how they get transmitted from one organism to the next. Of course, they knew about reproduction, but just these kind of discrete traits that Mendel was describing, um, Darwin didn't really know anything about this. He had some intuition. I'm sure he understood you know, some of the ways in which these things occurred. But as far as having this concrete evidence, um, you know, that wasn't really available to him at the time. And what a lot of people believed at the time kind of along the lines of spontaneous generation and things like that was uh, just this idea of blending. And it makes perfect perfect sense really to the lay person um, that, you know, you have uh, an individual that's born and it, it, the, uh, the individual has traits of both uh, the mom and the dad, the parents, and it kind of looks like they were blended together. And while that makes perfect sense to the average person, to Darwin and other scientists, other thinkers of the time, really, um, they realized that this was wrong because what it did was it eliminated the variation. Okay, so if you're blending these things together, eventually they're all going to look alike. And what you're doing is you're eliminating this variation. And, you know, so they were really looking for an alternative way to kind of explain these types of things. 
and the irony of the whole situation is is at the time that Darwin was publishing his stuff, um, you know, in the late 1850s, 1860s, this is when Gregor Mendel was publishing his paper with peas and genetics and things like that. But Mendel's paper went unnoticed for about 50 years. And it wasn't until the early 20th century when scientists started to uncover the work of Mendel. And that's when it became obvious that what Mendel was saying, what Darwin was saying, really had, uh, you know, a, a lot of... Uh, congruency, uh, a lot of implications that were uh, um, very profound and they, they really meshed really well together. Okay, and this is where scientists were starting to draw these parallels, and this kind of got mixed in or or combined to uh, um, give rise to the idea of population genetics, and to discuss and study and and understand how populations change over time and why they change and what causes these changes, and you know, of course, it's the the natural selection and how that's interacting with you know uh, massive amounts of of uh, organisms instead of just the individuals. Sure, the individuals themselves are the ones that are actually reproducing, but those the population is what's harboring uh, the, the genes, so to speak, uh, or the genome or the gene pool of these particular organisms. And as scientists began to learn more about Darwin and what he was saying, about what Mendel was saying, as it was becoming more accepted in the scientific community, uh, many scientists, many intelligent scientists that were working on these things developed what's known as the modern synthesis. And what that is is really a comprehensive type of a theory of evolution that incorporates a lot of different fields of science from the idea of competition and how these organisms are going to fight um, really with one another for the particular resources, um, you know, the idea of natural selection, the mathematics of, of how this whole thing works, and, and a number of other types of things. The cytologists that were studying the cells and, and the, uh, you know, the, the, the transmission of genes, the, the reproductive scientists, all of these types of things were kind of being incorporated into what's known as the, again, the modern synthesis. And this is really a, a comprehensive theory of evolution that's tying in a bunch of different branches of science to kind of help people better understand how evolution actually works and what it's actually um, trying to say, okay? So we covered this a few minutes ago. We talked about populations, and these are the groups of individuals. These are the organisms that breed with one another. Um, they're often localized to certain regions, and they can be isolated from one another. They can mix with one another. And it's often, as you'll see, especially in the next chapter, when we start talking about how um, evolution results in um, really the origin of new species and so forth, as these populations become isolated from one another, they're still under the influences of biology. In other words, mutations are occurring competition is happening and if these um populations aren't interacting with one another if they're continually to to be isolated what's going to happen really is they're going to start um, changing more and more um, within those populations relative to one another and that's what could potentially give rise to this idea of a new species because the organisms have isolated long enough are going to develop enough differences that once they're brought back together they're no longer going to uh, mix and breed and, and produce offspring. Okay, so we'll get more into that really in chapter uh, 24. So the, uh, the populations themselves, when we start looking at them, when we talk about a gene pool, we're talking about all the particular alleles at a particular spot on the chromosome. That spot on the chromosome, of course, is called the locus. So all of the genes in the gene pool at that particular um, locus, um, we refer to collectively really as the gene pool. And we can say that if one uh, uh, allele exists, one particular type, for instance, if everyone has brown eyes, we say that that particular um, trait is said to be fixed and all of the organisms would be homozygous. Okay, They would have the same genotype. And if more than one allele exists, then you can say that the individuals could either be homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, or they could be heterozygous. Okay. So in the next talk, next uh, uh, part to this uh, chapter, we're going to talk about allele frequency. Okay, so if you got any questions, of course, as always, make sure you write them down. And if not, we'll talk to you soon.